to the book of Zechariah tonight, uh, Zechariah chapter 4. We're going to be reading that whole chapter here tonight, and this is going to be a message. I, I've had this message just turning in my heart for a while, and I said, man, God, I, I, I'd like to preach that one day if He'd let me, and uh, He's letting me tonight. Hey, man, I'm excited about preaching this because I feel like there's so many good things here. Uh, it's sometimes when we get into some of these uh, minor prophets, there's a lot of complicated things we run into, visions, and uh, some things are future, futuristic, things that we don't always understand nor see. Uh, but I'll tell you tonight, I believe this is just going to bless your heart. Amen. Zechariah uh, chapter 4. And uh, when you get there, we're just going to... We're going to read and we're going to ask God to help us. Amen. We need, his, we need His help tonight. Praise the Lord. We look at this whole chapter. We're going to read it. I know it seems like a good bit of reading, but it's, it's only about 14 verses. We're going to read this and it's going to take some interpretation. Amen. It's going to take us some time uh, understanding what this is. And if I was to title this tonight, it would be simply... Uh, I was trying to think of a good title. I was sitting at the table with Brother Adam. I said, well, Brother, I got a message. I just ain't got a title. <laughs> and uh, he was giving me some good thoughts, Brother. I liked them all. But he said, I don't know the context of your message. That's tough. I said, well, I said, yeah. I, said I guess that is tough, isn't it? Amen. I said, I, tonight, if I was to preach to you, I, I guess it would be basically olive trees and uh, mountains, basically. There was uh, something else I was going to throw in there, but it's not there in my mind right now. But we're going to preach Zechariah chapter 4 tonight. Amen. I'm going to ask God to use this because I know God can help us and just bless us. Was, I've got it. Olive trees, candlesticks, and mountains. That's the three things I want to talk about tonight. So Zechariah chapter 4, we're going to read that whole chapter. And if you're there, give me a good amen. It says, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that wakened out of his sleep. And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lampstands thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. And two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not? What these be? And I said, No, my Lord. He answered and spake unto him, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, that thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this house. His hand shall also finish it. Thou shalt know that the Lord of the hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see, see me plummet in the hand, see in the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again, and, and I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what, the, what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Amen. Now, th these verses here are unique, are they not? Amen. This is one of the visions here. And this great and wonderful book of this minor prophet, uh, I was reading through this and studying, and man, a lot of visions here, things you wonder about, and, and we're going to talk tonight here about this olive tree, these candlesticks, and we're also going to talk about these mountains that were moved. And tonight, I'm going to take my time with the Lord's help. I've got to lay a foundation to you in order to enjoy and appreciate these passages of Scripture. And then we're going to try to move into the message with God's help tonight. But understand this tonight. As we look at these prophets, much like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Zechariah here was also a priest. You can find that in the book of uh, Nehemiah, I believe it is, 12. And according to the tradition, he was a member of the great synagogue as well. And that great 
great synagogue at one time, later on up the road, would become actually what is known as the Sanhedrin. We understand that this man was a priestly man. We also would understand that this is, this is about when the children of Israel are coming back from captivity and they're striving to build the temple again. Now, I understand that naturally, unless you study those phrases and what, what I'm talking about there, it's hard to know exactly what's going on. But we would understand that when the children of Israel were in captivity, we know around 538 B.C., give or take a few years, there was a great proclamation of Cyrus, uh, we, we know the king there, that Israel was allowed to return from Babylon to her homeland underneath the civil leadership of a man by the name of Zerubbabel and the spiritual guidance of a high priest by the name of Joshua. We would also understand that during that time there was about 50,000 Jews that returned and in 536 BC they began to rebuild the temple. You would find that there in the book of Ezra chapter 3. But we also would understand in that time of rebuilding the temple we know that as they went there and were rebuilding the temple there was a great bit of opposition from the neighbors and not only was there opposition from the neighbors from them building the temple but there was a great deal of indifference within the hearts of God's people when it came to reestablishing the temple. Sixteen years later, there was a prophet who showed up on the scene by Haggai, or Haggai as you may call him, and we would also understand that him and Zechariah were commissioned by the Lord to deal with these issues, to stir up the people for number one, not only to rebuild the temple, but also to reorder the spiritual priorities that took place there within that temple. As a result of this, as I begin to study this, you would understand the temple was completed four years later after these two wonderful prophets begin to speak. Now I would have you understand something here because once again get your mind in this context. They come from Babylon. It's 50,000 men. You have Zerubbabel leading them. You have Joshua as a high priest and you have these men and all of this opposition but among them are raised up these two unique prophets by the name of Haggai and also by the name of Zechariah. And even though Zechariah was kind of a contemporary of Haggai here, we would understand this, that their messages were parallel, but their methods were different. How many know sometimes you can have the same message, but some different methods in order to get them across? As you read there in the book of Haggai, his method of talking to the people, he was ba he's basically reprimanding them and dealing with them, with their lack of trusting God and their indifference. And he was used to start a great revival there. But Zechariah was used to keep the things going. There was momentum that was built underneath Haggai. But understand, underneath Zechariah, God began to use him to keep the people motivated. And he did that by, by a very positive emphasis. He began to put emphasis, look on not just the indifference of the people, but he began to talk about the promises to the children of Israel and what God was going to do for them. And when they were hear them promises, it would motivate them to want to finish what God has started. Started. Aren't you happy that God has given us some promises? Amen. There's sometimes like Haggai, there has to be times of reprimanding and times of rebuking and reproving. But thank God there's seasons like Zechariah where we can begin to talk about and focus on the promises of God and know what He has in store for His people. So as we look at this here tonight, we would understand that these people are going through a lot of things. But here Zechariah has all these different visions here in the book of Zechariah. I begin to read them and man there's like four visions that they start off with they've already we look at these visions and, and once again I, I've just got to touch on them a little bit to bring you up to chapter 4 here tonight there's these four different visions that Zechariah uh, got there in the beginning of his book there and the very first vision that Zechariah saw he saw a man later to be shown be the angel of the Lord seated upon a horse among these myrtle trees in this ravine and it symbolized as we would see in verse 16 this was the visions and interpretation. This is what the Lord says. I will return Jerusalem with mercy and there my house will be rebuilt and the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem declares the Lord Almighty. So we start seeing as God has given Zechariah these visions they are in encouraging visions. He's seeing this man over here on a horse right there among these myrtle trees and God's telling us look that's the angel of the Lord. He's coming there. there he's going to rebuild the temple. The second vision was four horns and Four craftsmen raised up to scatter them. And the angel explained this as the destruction of those who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter his people. He was saying, look, I'm going to protect you during this process. I'm going to bless you and protect you. And all of your...
your enemies will be scattered. In the third vision, a man was seen going out to measure Jerusalem. And this is one of my favorite I like to preach about. And the angel explained as he was going, I mean, you have to understand that Jerusalem at this time has been ransacked. It has been destroyed. I mean, it's in rubbles. The enemies are there. And you have this vision of this man that has this measuring rod, this measuring stick. He's going out to measure Jerusalem. And, and, and basically Zechariah is telling him, man, how, how long are the walls going to be? How big is the city going to be? And the angel said unto him, it will be a city without walls because of the great number of men and livestock in it. He said, look, it's going to be so big, we can't even build walls around it. Amen. What a beautiful promise unto the church and his people. Then there was this fourth vision which rounds out the first set. It showed us that Joshua, the high priest, is standing before the Lord with Satan at his right side to accuse him. He was clothed in these filthy garments, but they were taken from him by the Lord. And he was reclothed with these clean garments and, and all these different nicer, uh, nicer garments there. And on this occasion the angel had charged for Joshua and then passed over this great prophecy and said this, he would remove the sin of the land in a single day. What promises Jerusalem had here? These, these 50,000 men that no doubt look like they are worn down and weary. They're trying to rebuild a temple. There's opposition from without and there's indifference within but oh God has given them visions and saying look this ministry is going to be so big you don't even need walls and one day there's going to come a savior and he's going to remove the sin of the land in a single day but that brings us now to the second set of visions in chapter 4 the movement leading up to the scene involving the high priest uh, begins again this time there are four clean clear visions that we're going to look at there is and we're not going to look at all I'm just going to mention them to you here tonight. There's the gold lampstand with the two olive trees. There is this flying scroll in chapter 5 there. There's a woman representing wickedness seated in a basket in 5, 5 through 11. And there are four chariots going out to the whole world in chapter 6. But tonight our focus is going to be on this first vision of the second set. And we're going to find that there's encouragement here that not only applied to Zerubbabel but it applies to you and I as a church living in a fallen world. We see this lampstand that Zechariah sees in this vision and oh how unique it is as we begin to describe it. This was a gold lampstand consisting of seven lights most likely. Most likely like the menorah that we would see there in the temple. But notice this, it was different in this sense. It had a bowl on top of it containing oil and there were channels or conduits running down to each one of those seven light sticks or candlesticks. I want you to try to get this if you can and, and I did go on Google and they have a lot of good pictures up there that people have drawn so take time and do it if you want to get a better illustration I thought about printing them off and passing them out amen I mean this giant bowl there and from this bowl there's seven different rods or seven different pipes that are going to seven different candlesticks there that's fueling them but then on top of that you have this bowl that is being fed that is getting its resources from these two olive trees that are standing beside it one on the left and one on the right and these branches are dripping down into this bowl. And this bowl is feeding those seven different lights there. Or those seven different candlesticks. I look at this and understand something here. This lampstand was gold and had seven lamps a part of it. There was little doubt that this intended to resemble, as I already said, that candle there. The candlestick there in the temple. But as we look at these differences, the added figures, the bowls and the trees and the conduits, we have to understand this. This represents an unlimited limited supply of oil to those lambs. You would understand in the ministry of the temple, there always had to be a priest that would have to go get the oil or the olives, and he would have to crush the oil out. It was a process, and that oil would have to be brought there to the candlesticks, and there the menorah there had to be fed constantly by a man, so it could burn all the time. But what God is saying here is this, what's fueling this ministry here is not a man, it's not a priest, but there's two olive trees that have an un, I mean, an unending supply that's feeding into this bowl, that's feeding these lambs, and he's letting us know something right here. There is an unlimited and an uninterrupted supply of oil to the lambs. Indeed, later on we can read and know what this talking about.
about. This is a talking about the beautiful power and the anointing of God that does not need the aid or the strength of man. But God tells us later on we'll do with it. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Aren't you glad to know today that we are tapped into something that can be uninterrupted? Nothing can stop the flow of the Holy Ghost into that church. Amen. It's not if Derek Jones can, continues on. It's not if Glenn Jones continues on. But I'm glad to know Brother Glenn would tell you the oil was flowing before him. It's been flowing before me. And as I look at us as a congregation today, I would encourage you to tell you, brothers and sisters, there is a flow that's trying to get into your life. There is a flow of anointing and oil that's trying to enter into the church world. That the world, guess what? Yes, they may pass laws and do things. But God wants you to understand there's a flow of the Spirit that is unending and can be uninterrupted in your life. The lampstand here represents two different things. Yes, we can say it represents the elect people of God. Yes, we can say it represents Israel and the church. I see here in the book of Isaiah. Now, you've got to follow me here tonight. I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. All in the Old Testament. Isaiah uh, even speaks to this of Israel being alive. Listen to Isaiah as he says this in Isaiah 62. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, the darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the people but the Lord rises upon his glory appears over you he's saying look there's darkness here but Israel you are to be a light amen we can read on through the Bible it says for Zion's sake I will not keep silent for Jerusalem's sake I will not remain quiet till her righteousness shines out like a dawn and her salvation like a blazing torch Israel was to be a light unto the nations they were to be that among them anointed ones them chosen ones but it doesn't stop with Israel. As we come to the New Testament, Jesus calls his disciples the light of the world in Matthew 5 and 14. He told them, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Matthew 5 and 16. He said, keep your lamps burning. Luke 12 and 35. In Revelations 1, we have the New Testament equivalent of Zechariah's vision. Jesus is walking among the golden lampstands. He's there as a priest that is trimming the wig and taking care of the candles. What I'm trying to tell you is this. We are to be a light but not just a light. We are to be a blazing torch in the world. I'm telling you brothers and sisters, the church has flickered long enough. We have stood on the edge of extinction long enough. The anointing of the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight and I might just preach to you. Amen. I'm telling you we stood on the edge of existence where the Holy Ghost is a back burner mentality. I'm telling you God wants you to tap in. God wants you to hook up. He wants you to understand that the oil of the Spirit is for you. It's for me. We don't have to be defeated. We don't have to be discouraged because there is a supply that this world cannot touch. Hallelujah. I feel like an evangelist tonight. That's all right. Praise the Lord. Notice this. The oil in Zechariah's vision is not something we've never heard of. It is that image of the Holy Ghost and the power of the Spirit that is supplied to God's people in abundant measure. If you're trying to live this without the Holy Ghost, shame on you. I don't want to hear anything that, that, that condones it. I challenge it. Bring me your Bible and sit down. We need the oil. I dare you. Bring a Bible. Convince me otherwise. We need the oil. I need the oil. You need the oil. If we try to live without it, we become religious legalists and dead. I'm telling you, dead. Twice plucked up by the roots. We end up being ineffective. And don't you ever think the Holy Ghost just smiles upon it. Amen. It's a shame where our ministries die up because we don't have the oil. And I'll tell you what's even a greater shame. We're hooked into a tree. And the oil has been supplied. And you're either so stubborn that you won't get the bowl underneath the spout or something. But the oil is flowing. 
And when it's flowing and we reject the oil, there is a problem. Hallelujah. There's a problem. I, I feel like I'm speaking as an oracle from God tonight. And you can take these words and you can eat them. Because thus saith the Lord, He's provided the oil. He's made a way. If I ever felt like preaching, I feel like preaching right now. I feel the gifts of the Spirit just an operation in my heart here to let you know the oil is flowing. And if you reject the oil, that's a problem to be reckoned with. It's a flowing. There's a tree that's pouring it out. It's an uninterrupted supply. There's no reason that we shouldn't be casting out demons. There's no reason that we shouldn't see the gifts of the Spirit. There's no reason that our children are not speaking in tongues and keeping that fervency and fire within them because the oil is flowing. Hallelujah! Aren't you glad for the oil? Don't live without it. I learned something over the summer. You don't put oil in a vehicle and check it just right, she'll lock on up on you. I had that old truck, and, and, and out of stupidity, yes, I, I'll tell on myself. I don't like telling myself too much, but here you go. I was checking the oil with the engine running. That's what you get. You buy a $1,000 truck, you don't really care about it, to be honest with you. You should, but it ain't a pretty thing. Look, somebody spray painted it. You thought it. And I remember driving that thing, and everything's going wrong. I said, man, they, I said, I ain't, I said, I try to remember, I said, it's just a clunker, be grateful. It's okay, Derek. And I remember that thing was knocking and a kicking, and, and I'd get so frustrated that I, I, I remember, and, and, and there in and, and construction class, and Daddy always tells you to turn the vehicle off, but for some reason, when you're mad at a truck, you don't think about it. I didn't, anyhow. When the oil's not in there, it's going to lock, it ain't running, it don't even sound right. I'll tell you this, you can tell when believers ain't got the oil flowing. Something don't sound right. Something's missing. Something's knocking. Something's clicking. Something, and matter of fact, it's not going as fast as it should either. Something is missing there. And there's a valuable commentary on Zechariah that a man by the name of Charles L. Finberg makes these major points on this. He says, number one, we need the oil because the oil lubricates and abolishes friction and it promotes smoothness. I'll tell you this, the Holy Ghost will make things a lot easier in your life. Amen. You'll, you'll, you'll go right up the tracks. You'll feel the, you'll feel the smoothness in your life. It goes on to say that oil can heal. In biblical times, wine and oil were applied to wounds. And no one but the Spirit of God can heal a heart or a wounded spirit. He said, number three, oil lights. He said, it's the Holy Spirit who illuminates the sacred page and the pathway of the believer. Number four, oil can warm. Whether it be the sad plight of a lost soul or the need of a fellow member in the body of Christ, the truth of God and our cold hearts are unresponsive, but God can warm that. Number five, he said, number, I mean, number five, he said, oh, he said, oil invigorates. It increases the energy of the Bible. And number six, oil adorns. It was used at the feast of the Old Testament times. It was applied as a sweet fragrance. You never wore the oil when you were mourning or in sorrow. You need the oil. It has purpose. Amen. So understand this. But what did the scandal represent? What was the message here? Well, Zechariah asked. He said, what is all this? And Zechariah asked for an explanation of the vision. And the angel tells him that it is a message to the chief civil ruler of Israel, Zerubbabel. So thus, the fourth chapter of the prophecy here is a message of encouragement to the leader of Israel, to Zerubbabel. And even we know early on the visions about Joshua and Satan there, that was encouragement to Joshua the priest. He's saying, look, this message and prophecy is to encourage the leader of Israel right now. And listen to the beautiful message that God wants Zerubbabel to hear. Number one, it's a general principle. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Now follow me for a second, because there's so many good points to make here. When Solomon was reigning, they had plenty of resources. I mean, they had all the olive trees. They had enough gold to buy. They had the greatest army that was on the face of the earth. But I'm telling you right now, when you're looking at the children of Israel, they have come back from Babylon. And I'm telling you, they're 50,000. And if you don't mind me putting it this way, they're barely surviving. They don't have nothing but minimal resources. They can't just be, be rebuild a temple and keep the lamp burning, so to speak. They don't have a mighty empire army. 
army, but that's when God was letting them know, yes, you may have plenty of resources and military power in that day, but he said right now, he says, he says not by might, which means military power, not by power which represents individual strength, but do not be discouraged as Zerubbabel. The Spirit will enable us to do the work. You may not have the resources, you may not have the power or strength within yourself, but the Spirit of God has the power. Brothers and sisters, as I look at this fallen world, I'm empty of resources. You can't just talk these people out of sin. You can't just go up and with just some rational thought. I, I talked to the other night. I, I talked to somebody who was a secular counselor. And they said when I went to college and, and they got their psychology degree, they said I realized that psychology in the Bible matches up everywhere. And I thought to myself, that's because you don't have the oil. You've got to depend on that. You've got to depend on the methods of your weak, pathetic, fallen mind. You've got to try to figure out how to diagnose everything with a disorder. You've got to try to figure out how the neurons are trying to feed all the other parts of the Bible. You've got to try to figure out why the neurons can't communicate here and all that stuff in this genetic makeup. Yeah, they got to try to figure out when there's enough endorphins and dopamine and all those things. But I'll tell you this what the problem is. And I know there's abnormal psychology and real mental disorders. I'm not trying to diminish all of it. But I'm telling you when you get the oil you can lay your hands on somebody discouraged. You can pray for the depressed. You can pray for the sinner. You can ask God to do a miracle and God can do it because it's not by might. It's not by power. Let me throw it in for 2017. It's not by intellect but it's by His Spirit say of the Lord. We shouldn't want to sing without the Spirit. You shouldn't want to go to Walmart without the Spirit. You shouldn't want to go anywhere without the Spirit. You shouldn't want to teach without the Spirit. You shouldn't want to preach without the Spirit. You shouldn't want to live without the Spirit. Because there is that tree, that anointing that's flowing. Why wouldn't we want that anointing in our lives? Why wouldn't we want that in the day in which we live? Notice the second reference he says here. He talks about obstacles to them. He's talking to Zerubbabel once again. What are you, almighty mountain before Zerubbabel? You will become level ground. It's basically what he's saying. He will bring out the capstone to shout, God bless it, amen, amen man of verse 7. So we look at this. Here's Zerubbabel is. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by my spirit. But Zerubbabel, there are mountains in your way. Anybody ever came to a mountain before? Oh, they exist. They exist. If you've never run into a mountain, you're probably on the wrong road. This world's full of mountains. You might be in the valley doing circles. So you got to figure out how to go forward here. Amen. He said, what are thou, O mighty mountain? Notice here, what mountains did, did, did Zerubbabel here have to face? Discouragement among the people, opposition from the enemy, poor crops, unstable economy, people not obeying God's law. I would say there are mountains in the life of the believer every single day. But listen to this promise here. Before Zerubbabel, you will become flat. You will become as level ground. Mountains cannot stand in front of the believer when he's operating in the spirit of Christ amen speak to the mountains as the old saying is there's no mountain in your way Zerubbabel that you got to worry about I don't have the money Lord the temple needs to be built don't worry about that I have a cow I have cattle on a thousand hill I have money you know the streets are made of gold up there he does not lack resources the mountains in your life you can see them removed they will go flat they will disappear they will diminish and they would say this in verse 7 as I read it to you he says what art thou a great mountain before Zerubbabel thou shalt become as a plain a plain as flat territory your life at times may seem like mountain after mountain. But through the Spirit of God, they become flat, plain territory. Aren't you glad God will do that for you? My God of heaven. Brothers and sisters, I, I have come to the edge of many mountains in ministry in my life. And it's amazing. You're praying one day, God, I don't know how I'm going to get over it. I'm looking at the climb and I know it's going to be exhausted but God, I know if you'll help this mountain, if you'll give me strength to climb, and you know sometimes God will make you climb the mountain, but isn't it wonderful when He just makes the mountain move? Man, it's a lot less effort. And there's sometimes I thought the mountain should move, He made me climb it. 
But there's other times in life, I mean, he just took it right out the way. And what I was worried about, and what I was stressed about, and what was bothering my mind, and what was trying to fry the circuits of my system, they disappeared. It is amazing. He said this. It goes on to say at the end of verse 7, the headstone thereof with shoutings crying grace and grace unto it. And another, another translation says God bless it and God bless it because God can move your mountains. The third promise to Zerubbabel was complete. And there was this, that he will complete the temple construction. Notice what it says. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple, of this house. His hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. I'm telling you what's a blessing in ministry. When you know God's given you something to do, and God's telling you, I'm going to finish that in your life as well. It's not going to go undone. The temple will be rebuilt. Aren't you glad there's things in your life at times where you're looking at it and the Holy Ghost just whispers in your heart, I've called you to this. You will finish it. Oh God. In ministry, once again, I, I can relate to Zerubbabel right here. Just just. Not on his level, maybe to this extremity. What pressure was on this man? But there's times in ministry, I'm telling you, God has whispered something in my spirit. He's reminded me. He's called me. And he's reminded me I'm going to do a work. He's reminded me I'm going to see a harvest. And I take those words and I say, Amen. God bless it. God bless it. He's saying the work is going to be finished. And it goes on to say in verse 9, verse 9 and verse 10, it says, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. He was saying this. I want you to get this today because this is an important part of the message. He said, Look, Zerubbabel, yes, it's not by might of power, but by my spirit. Spirit. And he goes on to let him know as well. He lets him know the mountain shall move out your way. And you shall see the temple be finished. But I want you to notice something right here. The language is amazing. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. It was a plumb line. It was a, a, a device of construction in that day. So I want you to notice this. Follow me right here. He's got promises, but there's still some work to do. You get that? The Holy Ghost has been provided, but Zerubbabel, you still got to pick up the plumb line, and you still got to do the work I've called you to do. It was four years later that the temple was rebuilt, which is still amazing in that, in that aspect as well. So what I'm saying to you today is this. There can be no shortcuts about this. God has blessed us. God has given us an unending supply, yes. But there are no shortcuts. The work still had to be done. The stone still had to be laid. And any worth, worthwhile work always begins at small and progresses from point to get bigger to bigger. Even Zerubbabel, the leader of Israel at this time, who had these visions given to him or interpreted to him, who was promised the fullness of the Spirit, even Zerubbabel still had to take the plumb line and work away at the ministry in which God God has given him. Which what I mean is this. There's times God does things immediately. But take the promises of God and work. Do something for Jesus. Yes, he's given you a supply. Yes, he will remove your mountains. Yes, he's given you a promise it will be finished. But you've got some work to do. My God of heaven. Abundant Life Tabernacle. It's not just going to happen. We're not just going to see an influx of souls just because uh, the Lord said that it's possible. We shouldn't be content with somebody getting saved every other, uh, once every six months or once a year. We ought to be ashamed. And look, I'm not saying every person that ever gets saved underneath the ministry here is always going to come here. I know we may witness to somebody that is homeless and God can touch them and they end up, I'm not against that. I understand that we live, we live in a day where people are trying to establish people. I know it can be difficult. I'm the pastor. I feel the pressure. And I feel the Holy Ghost pressing me. But I realize this. I've got promises. There's a spirit that's here to help me. God said it can be finished. But you've also got to pick up the plumb line and do the work that God's called you to do. 
this mentality that's, that's morphed into the church mind. Well, people almost say things like this. Well, if God's going to save them, they'll just save them. I ain't going to do anything. I'm just going to survive. Lord, oh God, come quickly. I hope the rapture happens today because this world's so bad. Ain't you victorious? Man, ain't, 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 the, ain't hell just scared of you? The devil's, just sitting, the devil's sitting there and said, Oh, Lord, now the devil don't mind you doing that. He'll let you stay neutral. But he has a problem, Zerubbabel, when you pick up the plumb line. Because he realized when you walk through those gates or you walk there upon the people into the camp, they're going to see you with that plumb line and somebody's going to stand up and say, it's time to work. It's time to start working on this. But notice it doesn't stop there. It, it, like it took four years. And, and notice as it goes on here, after the angel had applied this fifth vision to Zerubbabel, his task here, Zechariah goes on to ask this question in verse 14. These, he begins to ask them about these two olive trees here notice then answered I and said unto him what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof and I answered again and said unto him what are these two and he answered and said knowest thou thou not and then in verse 14 then said he these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth now there's some immediate context here and there's some futuristic context as well right now you had Joshua as the high priest, and Zerubbabel, right? Now, once again, please, you've got to get this because I'm afraid we're going to miss it. And I don't, I don't want to lose you right here. But notice, this was the question from Zechariah. Then answer I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees on the right and the left? Notice the answer. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord and the whole earth. Notice in verse 12, he said, don't ask about the olive trees. He asked about the olive branches. So Zerubbabel and Joshua are just branches of the tree. But my Lord, what, is these, what are these two trees? We come to the New Testament and we see one that has a spirit without measure. We get to 1 John chapter 15. He talks about the vine. He talks about being tapped into the vine. He talks about being a part of the vine. And we understand here that it's a reference to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. We see here the anointing of the Lord. And this is what I would give you tonight. But there's more for us to understand. It's one thing Joshua and Zerubbabel are identified as two branches of the two olive trees. But they're not the trees themselves. We know that as we read this and get this in our mind, these are given facts in Scripture that Jesus Christ was a priest and a king. He was the very, he was the very one, the very anointed one, the one and who the oil flows from and through and he is the one that the spirit was sent so where does this oil come from it comes from above I'm not trying to confuse you tonight with all this different prophecy and all this stuff but this vision is not complicated we have the olive trees we have the candlesticks and we also have the mountains but I'll tell you this right here tonight. What I feel like the Holy Ghost wants to remind us of right now is you're standing to your feet. If you would, please stand to your feet. As my wife makes her way to the piano. I look at these verses and I am challenged to know this. Are you? Do you have a flow of the Spirit in your life? And let's not, look, we are a Pentecostal church. Let's not dummy this down and say, well, you got the Spirit when you got saved. You did get a portion of the Spirit when you got saved. You got regenerated. No, duh. I know that. But I'm telling you, the flow and the anointing and the unction of the Holy Ghost is not just that. It's when you have been filled with the Spirit, baptized in the Holy Ghost. So these are the mystery of these candlesticks. As Jesus, I want you to notice this. When we get to the book of Revelations, Revelation, excuse me, don't want to mess you up there. There's one revelation of Christ. We have the seven golden candlesticks, right? Now, there's arguments. Was it like the menorah there? Does it have seven branches or were they seven individual candlesticks? I don't care. Jesus was walking among them. Amen. But do you notice what Jesus is doing? 
As he's walking among the seven golden candlesticks, he's looking at them. He is analyzing them. He is talking to Ephesus. He is talking to Thyatira. He's talking to Sardis. He's talking to Philadelphia. He's talking to Laodicea. And whichever one I would probably miss, Sardis, I believe it is. He's talking to them. He's beginning to touch on issues that why I believe there is. He's talking to them and let them know that if you don't, if you continue in the state you're in, we know that he blessed two of the churches, but there was five of the churches that were not in good standings. He threatened them that I'm going to remove your candlestick. And I would say, what a shame it is when we have a vision of what the church should be in Zechariah chapter 4 with the bowl of this unending supply of the anointing. But we end up like Laodicea, or we end up like Ephesus. And we're not going to go through all the seven churches. We don't have time. I've got a message I never preached on that, but I, a message I want to preach on. You've got mail. There's a message coming to you, Ephesians. Ephesus, you have left your first love. There's some that are suffering Jezebel to teach. Or some like Laodicea, you know, they're saying we're rich, we're increased with goods, we have no need of nothing. But Christ would say back to them, you are poor, miserable, blind, and naked. But then he tells them, buy of me gold that have been tried in the fire. Yeah, I want you to get that contrast right quick. Laodicea, you're broke. Go buy some gold. How do you buy gold when you're broke? I'll tell you what it is. Jesus Christ has a gift for the church. He gave us the purest thing called faith. He's given us the Holy Ghost. You can't afford it. You can't buy it. Don't even try it. You can't come up with it. You ain't going to get a loan. But there's a tree that's producing the oil that's flowing into the bowl. How many wants that flow into their lives? We need it, brothers and sisters. I know sometimes getting into these minor prophets can be confusing. It's a lot of words that we speak here. But if you mean that from the bottom of your heart, and I, and I'm, I, I, want to, I want to call you to the altar, and I am, but I feel like right here, the, the unction that I feel tonight, I don't want to just give you a general altar call, and it just, it just blows through your mind, and you can pray for 30 seconds and get up. We're not looking for that. I want there to be commitment. If you already got the Holy Ghost here tonight, act like it. Live like it and let the oil continue to flow. If you need the baptism, let it flow in your life. Let God help you. But there's an unending supply that is available. All you got to do is hook yourself up to the tree and let God help you. Come find you a place to pray tonight. Let God help you. Amen. I want you to leave here encouraged. We've got the olive trees. You've got the candlesticks. You've got the mountains. And this was a message of encouragement to Zerubbabel. I've got a message for you, Zerubbabel. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Hallelujah. It's by my spirit, saith the Lord.